So we're ready to look at an example where we actually compute the absolute extreme values of a function. Uh, polynomial, so definitely continuous function on a closed interval, right? So we know, that we know that the absolute extreme values exist. They're guaranteed by the extreme value theorem. How do we find them? Well, we know that our absolute extreme values are also relative extreme values. And we know that there are two possible places where those relative extreme values can occur, a critical point or an endpoint. Right? So this gives us a strategy. Right? Well, step one of the strategy, confirm that your function is continuous and your interval is closed, right? So we're in the appropriate context. Um, as long as that's in place, well, what we should do is we should find critical numbers. Next, we should compute the corresponding critical values. Next, we should compute the values at the endpoints of our interval. And finally, compare all of those, right? Um, the values that we get in these two steps, there's only going to be finitely many of them. So we just have to put them in order from smallest to largest. The smallest will be our minimum. The largest will be our maximum. Um, one thing to take care of as you're proceeding is to remember that critical numbers have to be in the domain. Uh, in this case, our domain is set to be this interval from 0 to 3. Um, so we have to make sure that any, any numbers we're plugging into our function are in the domain. Otherwise, we can get ourselves into trouble. OK, so let's proceed. What's the first step in our solution? Find the critical numbers. OK, so we know that the critical numbers are going to be those points where the derivative is either 0 or undefined. Our function is polynomial, so we know that it's differentiable everywhere. So this is simply a matter of computing the derivative and finding the zeros. So we have 6x squared plus 6x minus 12. And we can factor this, right? So we factor out a 6, and then we're left with x minus 1 times x plus 2. And that means that f prime of x equals 0 for x equals 1 and x equals minus 2. Now, x equals minus 2, we throw it out because it's not in our interval, right? So this is not in the domain. And that means that c equals 1 is the only critical number. OK, so we've got our critical number. What's next? Find the corresponding critical value. Uh, be careful, right? The critical value is the value of the original function, not the derivative. We know what happens when we plug 1 into the derivative. We get 0, because it was a critical number. That's how it was defined. Um, so what we need now is f of 1. So f of 1 is going to be 2 plus 3 minus 12, which comes out to negative 7. OK, there's our critical value. Next, end values. So we need f of 0 and f of 3. f of 0, well, we can tell right away that's just 0, right? 0, 0, 0. f of 3, what do we get? Um, 3 cubed is 27 times 2 is 54. Then we're adding 3 times 3 squared. So 3 times 3 times 3, so 27, minus 12 times 3, so minus 36. And if we add all those up, double check my arithmetic, but I'm pretty sure that comes out to 45. Okay. 
They're all multiples of nine, right? Six times nine plus three times nine, or sorry, um, so yeah, that's right, minus four times nine. So six plus three minus four is five times nine, 45. Okay, so we've computed the end values. Now we compare, and the comparison is simple. We look at these one, two, three values. We see which of those is the smallest. Minus 7. Which of them is the largest? 45. All right? So um, we see that F has an absolute max. And we could just say 45, but it's usually a good idea to also give the x values where that max and that min occur. So f of 3 equals 45 is the absolute max. Um, there's sometimes more than one x value that will give you that number. In this case, there's only one. And f has the absolute minimum value of f of 1, which is minus 7. Okay, And then we're done.